apologize. Um, Mishi is the National Field Director of the Youth First Initiative, a campaign to end incarceration of young people in youth prisons and to invest community-based alternatives, uh, invest in community-based alternatives to incarceration. Before she joined Youth First, Mishi worked at the National ACLU as the Juvenile Justice Policy Strategist. She also worked at the ACLU of Washington, where she led a campaign to end the death penalty in Washington State. She has served as the Director of Youth Justice Programs at the Children's Defense Fund in New York, as the Special Assistant to the Commissioner in the New York City Department of Probation, and as the Director of the Juvenile Justice Project at the Correctional Association of New York, where she coordinated the New York Juvenile Justice Coalition. She received her undergraduate degree from Swarthmore College, and she held graduate degrees from Oxford University and the New School of Social Research. Um, so, Mishi, welcome. Before we get started, one person has texted me to say she can't hear anything. Um, Pamela, you may have accidentally muted. Um, you should be able to hear. Uh, can other people hear the call? If one or two people could just text me to let me know that you're hearing the call, that would be great. Debbie? Yes? This is Tricia. I, I can hear. Um, something happened and I got kicked off computer-wise, so I'm, okay. I'm not remote. I'm not remote. All right. So it looks okay. like one person, because I'm getting several like texts. One person, because I'm getting several texts. Okay, so it looks like it's just one okay. person. So it looks like it's just one person. Let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to turn the call over to Mishi. Mishi, if you'd like to start. Yes, thanks. Thank you so much, Deb, for um, organizing this webinar. And um, as Deb said, I'm the National Field Director of the Youth First Initiative. So I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about our initiative, some of the goals of the initiative, and some of the work that we're already carrying out in, in, some, in some of our target states. Um, so before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about youth incarceration in the United States. There's uh, currently about 54,000 youth who are detained or confined in youth juvenile facilities. And when I say detained, I'm talking about young people who are being held in detention centers pre-trial. Uh, and confined, we're talking about young people who have been adjudicated and are held in juvenile facilities as a result of that adjudication. And the United States pays, spends about $5 billion a year on youth incarceration. And the Youth First Initiative is working to end youth incarceration for three main reasons. It isn't safe, it isn't fair, and it doesn't work. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these three points. The youth incarceration isn't safe. We, we, see, we know that young people in youth facilities are subject to intolerable levels of physical abuse and sexual violence. The Bureau of Justice Statistics did a survey that found that uh, nearly 10% of all youth who uh, participated in the survey reported being victims of sexual abuse, either by other youth in facilities or by staff. We also see that most youth facilities around the country um, have excessive use of physical restraints, mechanical restraints, and chemical restraints. In Nevada, for example, uh, the uh, staff admitted to hog tying youth at the Nevada Youth Training School in Elko, and that's just one example of excessive use of restraints that we see in facilities around the country. Another widespread problem in, in youth prisons is the overuse of solitary confinement. And we know that solitary confinement you know, is harmful for, for, for anybody, but it's particularly harmful for young people who are still developing and it can have long-term you know, emotional uh, trauma uh, on young people. And youth incarceration is not, you know, it's not applied uh, equally to young people. It it's disproportionately affects youth of color. And the most recent statistics on disproportionality show that African American youth are incarcerated at nearly five times or four and a half times the rate of white youth. Uh, Native American youth are incarcerated uh, over three times the rate of white youth, and Latino youth are also um, overrepresented compared to white youth. In certain states, 
really have astronomical disparities when you compare incarceration rates of white youth versus incarceration rates of youth of color. So in New Hampshire, for example, the incarceration rate of African American youth is 36 times higher than the incarceration rate of white youth. In New Jersey, we see that it's 26 times higher. Connecticut, it's 18 times higher. And for Minnesota, the incarceration rate of Native American youth is 13 times higher than the incarceration rate of white youth. So, the, you know, this, uh, we are, we're very concerned around the racial disparities in the system. And the third reason that we're working to, uh, to end youth incarceration is because simply it doesn't work there's extremely high recidivism rates from almost every youth uh, correction system in the country. For example, in New York, one study, a longitudinal study that followed youth for 10 years after release found that more than 90% of young people released from juvenile facilities in New York end up with an adult conviction. Um, so it's astronomically high recidivism rates. Um, and New York is not unique in, in having extremely high recidivism rates. We have also see that youth incarceration is overused. The majority of young people who are held in juvenile facilities have not been uh, convicted of, of serious crimes. They don't pose a threat to public safety. In fact, the majority of young people uh, in youth facilities around the country have been, are adjudicated for misdemeanors. Status, uh, if you combine it, a uh, majority are adjudicated for misdemeanors. Status offenses, which are crimes that would not even be a crime if they were an adult, things like truancy, you know, uh, not going to school, curfew violations, running away, uh, quote-unquote incorrigibility. And youth incarceration is, it has, you know, exacts, you know, a, a real toll on families, and it's, it makes it very difficult for families to contain, you know, to maintain ties with their children. Many of these youth facilities are located, you know, remote areas of their states, very far away um, from the communities where the young, where the young people's families live. And we've also seen that youth incarceration really impacts negatively on young people's education. M many young people after they're released from facilities are not able to re-enroll back in school. Sometimes schools will not take them back. In other cases, they don't get any academic credit for the work that they do while they're incarcerated. There's been several studies that have come out, uh, most recently a, a piece by, from the Council on State Governance that found young people are not getting adequate educational services while they're incarcerated. And so all of this you know, adds up to, to young people being set up um, for failure when they go to youth prisons. And it really does set them up to, for incarceration in adult prisons. Um, Deb, for some reason, I'm not able to um, move to the next slide. Could you could you switch to the next slide for me, please? Sure. Thank you. I'm not sure why it's not working right now. Is this, which one do you want? Number eleven. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so this this slide. I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to read, but this is a slide that shows that we've seen huge drops in youth incarceration over the last um, you know, 16 years or so. And so almost every state has seen a pretty dramatic reduction in youth incarceration. There's only a few states that have had increases. West Virginia is um, one of the few states that have had increases, and we're actually uh, one of the states that we're working in right now. And so um, that gives us a real sort of um, window a window of opportunity to really um, work in states. Um, hold on one second, I'm just having a little bit of problems here. Okay, all right, now my connection has been reestablished. Okay, so yeah, we, we, so we've seen that there is um, a real opportunity to work in states to reduce youth incarceration. The good news is that polling shows that the majority of Americans support uh, rehabilitative programs for young people. Uh, one poll found, found that 76% of 
uh, of people polled believe that young people are capable of positive growth. Another poll found that 77% uh, of people believe that young people should um, have opportunities for rehabilitation. Uh, and, that, and this poll found that, you know, by overwhelming majority, people preferred prevention and rehabilitation over punishment and incarceration. And the, the poll also found that people who have experience in the juvenile justice system, young, particularly formerly incarcerated young people, uh, are the most effective messengers when it comes to talking about juvenile justice issues. And um, Deb, could you could you move to slide ten for me, please? Which one do you need? Slide ten. Okay. You should have it now. Okay, um, so slide 10 just shows that, you know, that we really have a huge window of opportunity right now to dismantle the youth prison model. The youth prison model really has been the signature feature of the juvenile justice system. So we have, um, most states have created these large facilities that look like mirror images of adult prisons with all the security hardware, you know, located in remote, uh, often rural areas away from where most of the young people and their, and their families live. Uh, but the good news is that there's been a huge drop in youth incarceration, as I've said, in the last 35, you know, plus years. And so, the, um, so this is, and as there's been a drop in youth incarceration, there's been a decrease in youth crime. And so people now recognize that there's no correlation between reduced incarceration and increased crime. And in fact, it's the opposite, that if you can decrease incarceration, you actually can drive down crime. And so we, we, the Youth First Initiative believes that we have this tremendous opportunity to ultimately transform the juvenile justice system. And, and, and invest in community alternatives. And so the Youth First Initiative is a national advocacy campaign to end youth incarceration and, and redirect resources towards community-based alternatives. And we are basically a campaign of campaigns. So we're working with individually branded campaigns in several states. Um, and so each of these campaigns has its, its own unique identity, um, you know, its own brand, and, they're, and it's led by folks in those states, you know, folks on the ground in those states, and the Youth First Initiative is providing support and technical assistance to those campaigns. We have a racial justice lens. We recognize that any reform that happens has to also uh, work to reduce the, the tremendous disparities that we see in the juvenile justice system, some of the disparities that I've mentioned earlier. And it's a field-wide strategy, meaning we're also bringing in other national partners to support the work that's happening in the state. So the long-term goals, ultimately our goal is to dismantle the youth prison model in the United States and to end youth incarceration. Uh, we're, we're trying to achieve a tipping point, so we're work, our goal is to work in 15 states within the next five years and to try to achieve a 50% reduction of youth confinement in those, in, those five, in those 15 states. We are working to work to use closed prisons in those states and reduce racial and ethnic disparities. Okay. My slides are not moving now again. Um, so Deb, if you could go to slide 14 for me, please. So our, our theory of change Okay, well, I think we're on slide 15. So uh, the way that we're, we work is this diagram shows the different types of assistance that we're providing to the states we're working in. Um, can, 
folks hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so this this slide shows uh, this diagram shows the different types of assistance that we're providing to states. So the, the our core for, um, form of our, our core activities we're providing intensive technical assistance to state campaigns. In addition to that, we are um, acting as a clearinghouse to provide state campaigns with information about best practices regarding juvenile justice. You know, uh, connecting them with the best data and research around juvenile justice. We also hold national um, and state convenings where we bring together our partners that are working in the various states along with national partners. We can learn from each other's experiences. We provide national communication support to each of the state campaigns. And we also um, connect each of the campaigns with strategic partners and connect them with um, other you know, allies that could be helpful in their work. So when it comes to our, our goal of closing youth prisons and investing in alternatives, there really are what we see as three major pathways. One, one major pathway is to have campaigns with the public stated goal of closing specific facilities. And in this case, it's often you know, very notorious facilities in states that it's really sort of a galvanizing um, effort you know, to bring folks together around closing some of the particularly bad big facilities in, in various states. But along, while, while we're working on that track, we also are working on policy reforms to reduce the number of young people who are going into facilities to drain the flow of incarceration. And at the same time, also working on policy reforms to create funding and invest in alternatives to incarceration. And, and this is really a critical piece because when we talk about closing these prisons, you know, the, obviously the first question is like, what are you talking about if, you know, putting in its place? And so we feel for the vast majority of young people that they can go, they can, be, they can stay in their communities, they can stay at home if there's the right supports and services in place for them. And there's very good models out there of community-based alternatives to incarceration. One example is the Youth Advocate Program, which is a program that assigns an advocate, which is like a mentor to a young person that basically is a, a case manager that provides all of the kind of 24-hour um, um, support that a young person needs, but then also links that young person up with a, you know, with kind of a wrap, with wraparound services and works with the whole family to, to identify whatever issues are in the family to, and helps them address it. The um, Youth Advocate Program is just one example of an alternative to incarceration program that works with young people and their families in their homes and, you know, and, and keeps young people at home and, and, and helps connect them with positive supports in their, in their communities. So some of the other policy strategies that we're working on is, and this is um, something that you know, has been very successful in many states, is uh, reforms to limit the eligibility for young people to go into facilities. Some examples, some states have you know, banned placement of young people for misdemeanor offenses uh, and, and for status offenses. I mentioned earlier status offenses are offenses that would not be even considered a crime except for a young person's status as a minor. Um, there's other states that have also, you know, um, limited placement for, for probation, for technical probation violations. And so that's one way to sort of stem the flow into the system. Another way is to reduce length of stay, uh, you know, to reduce the length of time that young people stay in facilities. And then another strategy that we're working on in several states is to redirect funding to community-based alternatives and to create incentives for communities to invest in these alternatives. So there's, uh, people are maybe familiar, there's some very good models out there that you know, many states have implemented fiscal incentives. Some of the most well-known initiatives are the with legislation in Ohio, the Reclaim Ohio initiative uh, in Illinois, Redeploy Illinois, in New York, which I'll talk about later, we worked on legislation called Redirect New York. And these are all um, efforts to redirect money that's being spent on youth prisons and give incentives for counties to invest in community alternatives. And the other goal that we're working on is to make sure that there is uh, accountability trans and transparency and there's ability for communities to monitor to what's happening to, um, with changes that are happening in the juvenile justice system. So, 
our targets are uh, our, our primary targets are state policymakers, governors, and governors, and our secondary targets are juvenile justice agency heads, juvenile courts, uh, county leaders, city leaders, and law enforcement. And Deb, if I can ask you to go to slide 19 for me, please. Deb, are you there? Okay. I mean, actually, now it's moved. Okay, it's working. I can do it myself. Okay. So, um, right now, the Youth First Initiative is working intensively in five states Virginia, Kansas, West Virginia, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We're also providing some support to Illinois, South Carolina, Nevada, and Ohio. And we're hoping to um, expand and work in Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Washington State, and Iowa. So those are the states that we're working in currently or that we're planning to work in um, within the next year or so. Um, I wanted to spend a little time talking about some successful campaigns to close facilities in, in several states. Because we're sort of we're really looking to those campaigns as models for the work that the Youth First Initiative is doing in states now. Um, and these campaigns, these are just a few. You know, I just listed a few examples of campaigns that have been successful in closing youth prisons, investing in alternatives. The um, Youth First Initiative is actually going to be putting out a report kind of documenting the stories of these campaigns as well as campaigns in other states, including um, Mississippi and um, Ohio. I think are some of the other states that are going to be documented in the report. But so this, I just want to mention some of these examples because I think they're great examples of states that, of campaigns that really were effective in not only in getting money invested in community-based alternatives to incarceration, but actually closing facilities and having that money redirected back into communities. And it, they were, I think they were all really good models in, in involving young people who have been directly affected by the system and having them become leaders in the system as well as family members of young people. And so they, in each of these campaigns, young people and family members really were leaders in the effort. So Books Not Bars uh, was a campaign in California where um, they were successful in closing several um, state-run facilities in California that they're, they're, they're were operated by the California Youth Authority now known as the Department of Juvenile Justice in California. Uh, and it was really led by family members who originally were trying to raise public awareness around the, you know, the really deplorable conditions of confinement with, within the California facilities. The Empty Beds Wasted Dollars campaign, and actually, actually I should mention something about uh, another thing about California was it was really, it, California implemented a lot of really in, interesting initiatives to shift funding from from the state-run system back into the um, localities. And so one of the things that they did was um, created a, a sliding scale system for funding. And so if a, if a county wanted to send a young person to the state facilities, they, if they were sending a young person who was convicted of a nonviolent offense, then the county was responsible for paying a higher rate um, for that, you know, to place that young person in the state facility, if they were sending a young person for a more serious violent offense, they would pay a lower rate. And so that created an incentive for counties, and it created a disincentive for counties to send young people to slow, particularly with nonviolent charges to state facilities. And it created an incentive for them to keep those um, young people in the community and, and to, um, in, and to like, invest in alternative programs in the community. California also created a block grant system where they, uh, put um, money that was currently you know, spent on the state system and, and, and block granted it back to counties um, to create more programs. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the um, Empty Beds Wasted Dollars uh, campaign in a, in a little bit, but uh, I'll give you more details about that. But some other successful campaigns was the Close to Lula Now campaign in Louisiana, which again was really led by family members. Uh, Flick, the Friends and Families of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children, really took the lead in calling for the closure 
of the to of the Tulula facility in Louisiana. And Louisiana has, you know, had a dramatic decrease in youth incarceration over the last 15 years. Uh, and so they've, you know, now um, are, are sort of become, you know, even though they're the, the leader in adult incarceration in the country in terms of incarceration rates, they have been, uh, they've made tremendous progress in reducing youth incarceration. Uh, do you see the No More Oak Hills campaign was successful in, um, you know, ultimately closing the Oak Hill youth prison, a notorious youth prison in D.C. And um, after Oak Hill was closed, the, the city created a, a much smaller facility, much more sort of therapeutic facility uh, along the lines of uh, what people consider the Missouri model. I don't know if everyone's familiar, but Missouri has um, become sort of a model in youth corrections because they have these very small therapeutic facilities that have much better outcomes for young people. And their facilities don't have any of the hardware security you know, of, of adult, um, of most um, youth prisons around the country. And so uh, DC really looked to Missouri as a model um, for having a small therapeutic facility. It's, a, it's much smaller than the Oak Hill, the New Beginnings facility. And they brought in staff from the Missouri Youth Services, train, and Missouri Youth Services Institute to train the staff in DC on this more therapeutic approach. So, Okay. Um, now, I'm, Deb, can you actually move to slide 21 for me? Sure. It may take a second to have a delayed move, but okay. There you go. Okay. Now it bounced back. Okay, there it is. Okay. So slide 21, um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the campaign in New York to close facilities. So um, I uh, was involved um, in this effort in New York and 2000, between 2007 and 2014, New York closed 21 youth prisons um, in the state. And so it was a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, it was really led by, we had this um, incredible reform-minded commissioner, Gladys Carrion, who became commissioner of the state juvenile justice system in 2007. So she really led the way to close these youth prisons. But even though, you know, she immediately, when she came in as commissioner, wanted to close these facilities, she also um, faced tremendous uh, resistance from the unions that represented the facilities as well as the legislators. Um, the, the unions that uh, represent staff who worked in the facilities as well as the legislators who represented the towns where the facilities were located. And the, in order to close facilities, she had to get approval from the legislature. And so there was a whole public education, advocacy, and organizing campaign that happened to get the support and to get the legislature to agree to close the, um, those 21 youth facilities in New York. And so... Some of the strategies that we used in New York uh, was an insider-outsider strategy. We worked very closely with the commissioner um, and you know, coordinated very closely with her staff on, on all of the work that we did to, you know, to publicize the need for closing these facilities. Uh, the other thing that was, you know, that, was, um, that was helpful was that um, many of these facilities we're operating, we're operating under capacity. And so uh, the state had created, a lot of communities had created um, alternative programs. And so this, a lot of these facilities were operating under capacity. And so we were able to highlight the tremendous waste of keeping these facilities open. And New York at the time had legislation that the unions had got passed saying that the state had to wait one year before it could close the facility. And so as a result, we had some facilities that were virtually empty, but the staff were still reporting to work every day um, in order to, um, you know, because the facilities had to stay open for a year. And so we were able to sort of publicize that. We worked with the, um, the administration to publicize the fact that these facilities were closed. We were able to bring in, you know, television cameras to show that. The other thing that had happened during this time was the U.S. Department of Justice uh, did an investigation found that found 
that young people's constitutional rights were, you know, being violated on a daily basis in this New York youth prisons, that there was um, an overuse of physical strength as a result. Young people were, you know, um, had dislocated shoulders, broken bones, rug burns as a result of these restraints, and that they weren't getting adequate medical, mental health care, or education. And so we were able to use the findings from the Department of Justice to really highlight the failure of the facilities. And then finally, like, the cost issue was a really important reason um, that the state ultimately agrees to close many of these facilities because it cost over, at the time, and now the costs have actually increased, it cost over $250,000 a year per child to incarcerate uh, a young person in, this, in a youth prison. And the community-based alternatives that are available in New York at the, in most places were much, much cheaper. I know they cost, you know, usually like not more than $15,000 a year per child. Um, and in terms of the cost, I just wanted to mention that the um, council and um, state government, CSG, just um, came out with some infographics that talked about the cost of youth incarceration. And it was, and the, the, the number that they used was nearly $150,000, on average, it's nearly $150,000 a year per child um, to incarcerate a young person in a youth facility. Um, so in New York, we, we really worked on building a, a coalition of as many um, partners as we could and also, you know, so upstate and downstate, rural and urban, and bringing in, um, really bringing in the voices of people who were directly affected, so young people who had been incarcerated in the upstate facilities, as well as the voices of young people who were in community alternatives and could talk about, you know, how those programs really helped them and the success, you know, the, and how they were able to achieve success as a result of those programs. And the other thing that was really important was having a strategic communications piece. And so really kind of identifying the key media markets in New York, particularly um, the market within the, the communities that we were targeting um, in those upstate communities where the facilities were located and, um, you know, getting the support of editorial boards um, in upstate papers is really critical uh, in ultimately getting these facilities closed. I think the other thing, oh. and then Ozeb, are you able to transfer the slide to 23? Sure. Just give it a second. It seems to have a delay when I do it. Okay. And it should be, it's on my screen, so it should be on yours now. Um, there go. Yeah, it's not. Sure, but I can. I can. See, okay. So, um, so the other piece that was really important for the work in New York was to create funding for community-based alternatives. And so, in New York, as in many places, when a young person is sent to a state facility, the state pays uh, either part of the cost or all of the cost. But when a young person stays in the community, there is no state funding um, for alternative programs. And so in New York, we've uh, introduced legislation that was ultimately enacted called Redirect New York. And it was really modeled after other states, including Ohio and Illinois. And it created 65% reimbursement for community-based alternatives to incarceration. And so that really helped kind of build a continuum of programs in the community so we can um, you know, say that we could safely keep young people in the community and not send them to facilities. And so that was one of the pieces of, of the reforms that we pushed in New York, as well as um, we were lucky in that the, the state recognized the need to set aside funding for the people who are affected by closures, particularly in upstate rural communities when facilities were closed who would be losing their jobs. And so the state did set aside a, f a $13 million fund for, um, you know, to um, provide job development and job placement for people, you know, who lost their jobs as a result of closures. Uh, the other thing that was really important about the campaign in New York that we're really trying to emulate in the work that we're doing in other states was an explicit focus on racial justice. And this was really important because 85% of the young people who were incarcerated in New York State facilities were Afri African-American and Latino. And uh, the majority of them were from New York City, and they were being sent to these very far away facilities, uh, very far from New York City in you know, rural communities across the state and as a way to provide jobs and economic development in those rural communities. 
so when Gladys Carrion became commissioner, she was very you know, vocal and you know, she was very direct about the fact that these communities, um, you know, that these, um, were, they were looking to these facilities as a way to provide jobs. And she said, you know, we can no longer you know, provide jobs on the backs of poor black and brown children from New York City. And it was, you know, so that was, um, it was incredible, incredibly powerful to have a state official recognize that and say that, you know, say that out loud. It's something that people kind of always recognize that no one was willing to say. And so there was a very explicit emphasis on, you know, why, you know, the, um, why closing facilities was good for, uh, it was, you know, as a way to promote uh, racial justice. Okay, so um, Deb, I again cannot, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 for some reason I'm having this network connection problems and I can't um, switch slides. If you could switch the slide 25, please. I just did it to go through in a second. Okay. Okay, got it? Okay, um, so this is just a quote from a young person who was involved in the campaigns in New York, um, in the campaign in New York to close facilities. And I think the, the quote, I wanted to end with that quote because uh, I think it really talks about um, how involving young people is really critical for the work, but it's also really critical. Um, and it's a really critical way to, for young people themselves to, to recognize their own power um, to, to work for change. Um, and so that's something that Youth First is really trying to um, do in all the states we're working in is to involve young people who've been in the system and really um, lift up their voices as a part of these campaigns to close facilities and ultimately transform the system. So if you could um, move to slide 26. Okay, should pop in a moment. So yeah, so I'm just going to end here, and I, I'm happy to take, I, I think there might be some questions that have been coming in, and so Deb is going to, um, you know, uh, read out those questions. Okay. I'm going to, um, first of all, thank you, Misi, and I'm going to put on your contact information so that anyone who wants to go back to the webinar knows how to do that. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and while I pose those to Misi, feel free, please, to um, send questions via the chat box to all of the co-presenters, and we'll take any additional ones that you have. So our first question is from Corinda Rainey Moore, and she says, I am wondering, um, Wisconsin has been listed as the worst state for blacks because of its incarceration of rates, rates of people of color, particularly African American men. Has there been any outrage to do anything in Wisconsin with regard to youth? One reason she's asking, uh, one reason this problem is so bad in Wisconsin is that because in Wisconsin, a youth is automatically waived to adult courts regardless of the crime if they are 17 year old. That means they have to argue and, and win if they're going to try and get their case put back into juvenile court. So if you could talk to us a little bit about whether there's an effort going on in Wisconsin, that would be great. Yes, and so yeah, that's, you're absolutely right that Wisconsin has um, some of the worst disparities in the country and incarceration rates um, for African American men in the adult prison system, but, as well, uh, but also um, huge disparities, some of the worst disparities in the country when it comes to youth who are incarcerated in Wisconsin's youth prisons. And so we have talked about the need um, to work uh, in states like Wisconsin where there are huge disparities. And some of this, we pick some of the states um, that we're working in now, particularly New Jersey, in Connecticut because they also, along with Wisconsin, have some of the worst disparities in the country. And so we have talked about Wisconsin. I think one of the um, challenges that we are trying to figure out with Youth First, and as you said, Wisconsin is one of the, um, you know, just a handful of states that once you're 17, you're automatically treated as an adult. Um, there's, a, you know, a few other states that are like that. There's not many because there's several states have raised the age, and Connecticut has raised the age, New Hampshire, Illinois, Massachusetts, and so now we're like, there's, it's a smaller number of states like Wisconsin, Missouri, Georgia, South Carolina, um, Texas, and New York, and North Carolina that, um, 
still have not, you know, raised the age to 18. And so one of the things that you first um, has been talking about is states like Wisconsin, I know that there has been a lot of work around raising the age, and that it seems like that's where um, most of the focus should go right now is on um, work to um, get that legislation to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 18. So I think that uh, we we want to do everything we can to support that, you know, to support that legislation and that effort. But our effort is really about um, reforms within the juvenile justice system and closing the large, you know, really um, harmful youth prisons and reinvesting money in alternatives. So I think we might um, think of Wisconsin as a state down the road. Hopefully, like, they will be able to raise the age of criminal responsibility and then that we could focus on um, efforts you know, to um, transform the juvenile justice system in Wisconsin so that, and hopefully the raise the age efforts that are happening now will also include uh, reform that will, you know, impact kids in the juvenile justice system. And I think that's also critical. As I know, like in Connecticut, when they raise the age of criminal responsibility, the, the legislation and the, the work also incorporated many other larger reforms that need to happen. Um, and so, or so that when young people are brought into the system that we didn't see increases in incarceration rates and we saw better services for young people in the juvenile justice system. Nishi, before I go on to our next questions, I just wanted to follow up to hers. Am I right in thinking that the Campaign for Youth Justice does a lot of work around raising the age at which kids go into adult court? Yes, exactly. So I'm glad you said that because I, I just wanted to, <laughs> I was going to say that exactly at that same point. So the Campaign for Youth Justice is a national um, organization that's working with state-based campaigns on efforts to raise the age, uh, to efforts to keep young people, um, to get young people out of the adult system and to have more young people go into the juvenile justice system. So we are trying not to overlap with states um, that are working with the Campaign for Youth Justice. And I know the Campaign for Youth Justice has been working um, uh, I believe it's been working in Wisconsin and other states around efforts to raise age of criminal responsibility and in other states to change transfer laws and working to get more young people out of the adult system. So we're going to move on, but Corinda, if you want to get in touch with the Campaign for Youth Justice, email me after the call and we'll um, connect you. The next question is from Ted Groves. And he asks, did books have a role in the California initiative, or was it just part of the initiative's title? Oh, did books have a role? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, yeah, the, t the name of the campaign was Books Not Bars, and the idea was that we should invest in community-based programming, including education for young people, uh, you know, instead of in spending money on youth prisons. Um, but so... So part of the, the message around Books Not Bars is that, like, you know, we need to, if we keep young people in the community, they're more likely to stay in school, they're more likely to be successful, they're more likely to continue their education. Uh, you know, I don't know if there was any explicit role for books in this campaign. Okay. Um, so we actually now have two questions, one from Jennifer Hahn and one from Ted Groves, which are connected. I'll ask Jennifer's first, um, and then we'll move on to Ted's. Jennifer asks, what does research indicate are the most effective ways to describe the facilities that we will need for the most dangerous or at-risk youth, and what differentiates these facilities from a youth prison? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And I, I mentioned the Missouri model because that's probably the model that, um, you know, is, is most well-known and probably the most kind of research to back up its effectiveness. And so uh, the way that people describe the Missouri facilities is that the, the most common ways you hear them described is that they're small and they're therapeutic, um, and they have a real focus on youth development. And so when you go to the, mm -hmm. the Missouri facilities, you know, they, they look very different than from what you, from the typical, you know, youth prisons. And so these facilities, uh, young people wear their own clothes, staff wear their own clothes. There's a lot of, staff get a huge amount of training. Most, all the staff um, have college degrees. Uh, and it's very much focused on, it's, it's, it's a therapeutic environment. And so there's a lot of focus also in creating sort of a positive peer culture within the facility. So young people do everything in groups. But it's, you know, it's kind of, kind of getting sort of like that positive um, peer influence, like, you know, positive peer pressure. And so young people don't want to let their group down, and they also, like, are supporting each other. And so a lot of the therapy happens within groups as well. Uh, but I think that the, the thing about – but the physical 
sort of aspects of the facility are also very different. For example, the um, Hogan Street facility in St. Louis is a facility for the most deep end youth in the Missouri system. And so they also hold young people who've been certified as adults and are being tried in adult court. Um, Hogan Street also holds those young people as well. So it's not just young people who've been adjudicated in juvenile court. And, and um, so there's young people who are, you know, there for murder, for kidnapping, rape, all the serious crimes you could think of. But when you go into Hogan Street, you would never know that it's a, a facility that holds young people who've been convicted of serious crimes. It looks, it's an old Catholic school. So you go in, there's just one metal detector when you go in. There's no fence around the building. There's no barbed wire. There's no, none of the security hardware, none of those, you know, closing steel doors or bars or anything like that. And so when you ask young people, like, you know, why don't you run? Because <laughs> basically it's like there's really no security. They'll say, well, I'm actually getting help here, so there's no reason for me to run. And so Missouri um, is sort of a model for having these small therapeutic facilities because we recognize that there's going to be some people who are going to need to be removed from, you know, their community for a period of time. And, um, and I, I think Missouri probably is the best example, you know, of the type of place that they could go. And uh, the research shows that they have much better outcomes in Missouri than in other states. And I talked about, like, you know, sky-high recidivism rates in New York, and that's just one example. But in Missouri, I think that the recidivism rates are, are much, much lower. Uh, what I've heard them cite is, you know, 15% of young people who are released from Missouri facilities end up coming back in the um, – coming back in the, in the Missouri system, the juvenile system, I'm not exactly sure what it is in terms of long term, but it's, I think it's much lower than it is for, um, for other states. So the, you've partially answered the next question, but I'll go ahead and, and ask it in case you have anything additional you want to add. Um, and that, again, is from Ted Groves. What are the chances that the new community programs will be evidence-based and has there been much in terms of research or effort? So I mean, you've already obviously talked to us about one state, but I'm wondering both um, in states where they've reduced the juvenile jails, you know, have they gone to um, evidence-based alternatives? And besides the state you've already talked about, what other research is out there that shows what works? Yeah, so there's, um, there's some good um, studies that have come out recently about, you know, looking at comparing the outcomes for young people who go to facilities versus the outcomes of young people who go to community-based programs. Um, people might have seen a report about Texas that the council and state governments put out called Closer to Home that looked at um, outcomes for young people. Because Texas also underwent tremendous reforms, particularly after 2007, and, um, and, and created a lot more community programs. And so that report shows that, you know, the community programs are much more effective in reducing recidivism than sending young people to facilities. Uh, in terms of evidence-based, I think that when we talk about evidence-based and juvenile justice, um, you know, <laughs> it gets, it, 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 we sort of have, people have this narrow definition of evidence-based because there are some programs that have gotten evidence-based label because they were able to do, um, you know, experimental uh, you know, they were able to have the control group and the experimental design, and, um, and, you know, it's very expensive to do that kind of research. And so there's certain um, programs like family functional therapy, multi-systemic therapy, multi-dimensional um, therapeutic foster care that are labeled evidence-based. Um, but I think, and those programs are, you know, I think that they are effective and they are, I think, and they, they have a place in a continuum of alternatives. I think it's important to not just limit the alternatives to those quote unquote, just those evidence-based programs, because there's other programs that are also very effective, but they um, haven't gotten the label of evidence-based just because they haven't done sort of an experimental design with a control group. I mentioned the Youth Advocate Program is one program that has a very effective model. Um, New York is, we're very lucky in that in New York City, we have, and also in New York State across the state, we have a lot of models of other types of community-based programs that are very effective in working with young people. Um, they haven't gotten the label evidence-based, but I think we could we sort of put that label of promising practices uh, because those programs have also shown to really have good outcomes for young people, reduce recidivism, um, but just have not gotten you know, that the evidence-based um, label yet. Okay, Ted has a comment, and then I have a question for you. His comment is, there is some interesting research on what makes people happy and 
brain development research. I think he means in brain development research. I would love to see some programs developed that is informed by this research. So I don't know if, in fact, that is informing the research or not, but that's his comment. Um, and then my question for you is, um, can you talk to people a little bit about how to interact with you beyond the survey that we've put on at the end of this webinar? In other words, I think you guys have put together some materials. If people want to see them, how do they get them? If people think their state might be ripe for your campaign to look at, um, should they reach out to you? Can you talk to people a little bit about that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. So if people are interested um, you know, to sort of explore Youth First kind of working in your states, feel free to email me. My contact information is right up on the screen, and you can feel free to, to email me. Um, or um, you, know, you can call me as well. Um, I can just give you my cell phone. It's 646-879-0754. And we're definitely interested in talking to you know, um, you know, as many states as possible about the, you know, what are the potential for reform in your state. Uh, we, the Youth First Initiative um, is going to be, we um, are just in the process of putting together our website. And so that's going to be up, I think, in the next few weeks. And there will be some resources on that website. Um, as and I mentioned, we're going to be putting out a report in, um, in January that sort of highlights the um, document the stories of effective campaigns around the country to close youth prisons and invest in alternatives. And so we'll be putting out that report, which we hope will be a resource to people. We're also putting together a, um, a toolkit um, for people who want to start campaigns or interested in being involved in campaigns in their states. And so that's something that's going to be available um, in the next few weeks as well when the website is up. And the other thing that we're putting together, which I think will be really interesting, is a national prison invent youth prison inventory. Um, and so we're just kind of listing all of the youth prisons around the country. And I think people have different definitions of what is a youth prison, but we're going by the definition of facilities that are over 40 beds. And so like the large facilities that are secure, that have sort of secure hardware, um, you know, as the, our definition of youth prisons. And so we're going to be putting together that inventory. And we obviously want feedback from people if they feel like you know, if there's facilities that are missing or facilities that are on there that wouldn't, you know, shouldn't be on there. Uh, we definitely, you know, we understand this is sort of like a, um, a work in progress, and so that's going to be another resource that's going to be available. That's going to be on our website in the next few weeks when, it, when it's uh, launched in January. Actually, I shouldn't say a few weeks, the next month or so, because I think it's going to be launched in January. Great. Um, I'm going to thank you very much. This has been wonderful, and I hope we've made some important connections so that you can keep doing this wonderful work. Um, and we really appreciate your joining us today. Um, there is a survey that, if I programmed it right, will go out to everybody after the call. Please do take a minute to answer it, um, because that's how we'll know whether we should be reaching out to you, or specifically whether Miki should. And uh, we will send, I will send out the slides to everybody after this webinar. And then once um, our website is up, we'll actually post the webinar there in case you want to go back and look at the information. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. And uh, I think this was of help. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting. Oh, it was my pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>